So we'll begin our discussion on data visualization uh, with two lectures that focus on uh, data preparation. So uh, as a part of that, today we will talk about data representation. Before going into the lecture, I wanted to um, um, present here two aspects uh, following up on the previous lecture on visualization pipeline. The first is about this very interesting idea called the Anscombs Quartet. So let's take a look at this data that is uh, in, the in the table here. The numbers are not so important. What you want to focus your attention on is uh, that there are um, two variables, x and y, and uh, you have different pairs uh, of values for for the val for the variables. If you look at the statistics that is shown down below, uh, you will notice that um, uh, for all instances um, of this pair of variables, the mean of x, the mean for y, the variance. Um, are all the same. Uh, the correlation is also the same between um, x and y. Right. So, um, looking at the statistics, one may think that all four instances um, are very similar to each other. Right. Uh, however, um, if you look at the figures below, you will notice that the first instance um, is looks like this. So all we have done here is taken the data x, y and uh, plotted them here using a simple scatter plot. A scatter plot is, um, is a visualization of um, column data such as what is shown in the table where the first variable is mapped to the x-axis and the second variable is mapped to the y-axis. So essentially you have a bunch of points on the plane. So the first um, instance is shows up like this, which seems to be uh, linearly correlated. The second instance shows up, if you plot the scatter plot, you get something like uh, the instance 2, where you clearly see that there is a nonlinear relationship between uh, x and y. Uh, the third instance, you again see a linear relationship, uh, much better correlated than 1. And in 4, you actually see uh, uh, a relationship which is quite different than uh, the others right where your um, uh, y is uh, independent of x um, except for one outlier which is somewhere out there now interestingly all four data um, instances have the same correlation uh, coefficient so it's clear that the statistics do not give you the full picture and there is some value in visualizing the data. So this example of the Anscombe squat is often given to, um, to motivate um, the visualization of data um, in addition to presenting statistics. So I encourage you to look at this very interesting and popular talk by Hans Rosling. Um, who is uh, a statistician. He likes to tell stories uh, with data. Uh, this is an old video. Uh, there are newer versions of this, but I, the original is still uh, very interesting. Um, so it's a TED talk. Um, uh, do take time out and uh, uh, look at this video. It's a very gripping story about population and uh, various other measures of the progress of countries. Again, it tells the story of um, how visualization helps um, 
present data and uh, the underlying phenomena in a very um, uh, gripping and uh, powerful way. Coming back to today's lecture, I want to talk about data classification. Um, more specifically, I will talk about the domain uh, over which the data is um, measured or computed. Um, so in talking about the domain, we will talk about the different uh, constituting elements or the cells uh, and data structures. And then I will talk about the attributes that are defined over every point or every cell in the domain. Uh, the pictures that I'm going to show here in this uh, lecture come from a, a very nice book by Tamara Munster on visualization analysis and design. Um, the lecture notes and this book is actually available online on Tamara Munster's website uh, if you are interested. And some pictures are also from the VTK book, the Visualization Toolkit book. So Tamana Munsna presents a very nice classification of uh, data. Um, so this is more like a cheat sheet. Um, it's not necessary to be able to look at the details here. We are going to talk about some of the data uh, classes in the in the in the la in the later slides. So Tamara Munster uh, talks about data and classifies them based on the type of data. Uh, so where it could be different uh, items, uh, records, links, positions, and so on. Um, um, or data it can be classified based on um, the data set, the collection of data records. Either is it, uh, is it available as a table, as a network um, collection of links, uh, or as a field um, um, in, in, in uh, 2D, 3D domain, um, or as geometry, um, or as clusters or collections of uh, records as sets. Um, and in each case, uh, um, uh, you have different types of tasks that can be accomplished, which is what is uh, shown here. Data can also be classified based on whether it is uh, static or dynamic. Uh, another way to classify data is based on the attributes and the type of attributes that is stored. The attribute can be called, can be categorical, um, where um, you have a name associated with each um, uh, each attribute. However, these attributes are not comparable. Um, hence different categories or categorical. The data, uh, the attributes could be ordered. Uh, so that could be a linear order uh, or a partial order um, uh, over the uh, attributes. So this could be something like temperature, let's say, or uh, um, integer valued um, attributes and so on. Uh, the data in general can be um, uh, quantitative and finer grained uh, where um, uh, they can again be ordered but in addition they can be compared meaningfully and the differences between the data types make sense. Um, now data that is quantitative can further be classified um, if there is a direction uh, to the order, if there is a single direction to the order, as in there is a uh, increasing direction or a decreasing direction. Uh, oftentimes there is a nice zero associated with the data. Um, and in this case, data is called diverging, where there is data is changing from the zero along the positive direction and the negative direction. Uh, in some cases, there is periodic conditions and uh, the data can be cyclic, such as uh, degrees um, and so on. Let's talk about the data classification again um, uh, in terms of the, the domain and the attributes. We'll start with the domain. Um, data can be one-dimensional, um, which is typically called as linear or sequential data. Uh, we can accomplish various tasks 
uh, on the data if it is one dimensional. So what I'm going to do uh, now is to talk about the different types of data and corresponding to each data, I will um, um, list the kinds of tasks, visualization tasks or queries that are associated with this data. Um, I'll probably talk about one of them and then but the others are listed in the slide. So these are self-explanatory. Uh, you should be able to read them. So let's take one dimensional data. Um, uh, an obvious task here is uh, an overview task. Um, uh, give me the total number of items uh, that are uh, in this data set. Another task which is um, a little bit more um, uh, detailed or fine-grained is um, given a certain collection of attributes find and report the uh, set of uh, items that have this particular attributes. Let's move on to two-dimensional data. Two-dimensional data is where the domain is planar, 2D. Uh, so map data is an example of two-dimensional data. Um, in addition to the tasks that are, are applicable to one-dimensional data, to in, for 2D data, we have um, a, a few additional um, kinds of tasks. Um, uh, the ad find adjacent items uh, task is similar, uh, is also applicable to 1D data. So given a uh, item, find me the uh, data items that are adjacent to it in uh, both dimensions. Another kind of query could be a containment uh, query. So uh, given, for example, a disk on the plane, find me all the data items that fall within this disk. Um, so these are range queries um, uh, that, need to, that may have to be answered efficiently. A few other tasks are what are listed here. 3D data is volumetric. Um, or geometric objects, real world objects. Uh, the adjacency and containment queries uh, hold here also. They are very much applicable. Um, but in addition, there can be other types of queries. Um, so for example, find me data that lie inside or outside uh, a particular uh, uh, region or above and below. Right? So there are three dimensions on which uh, these kinds of uh, queries can be posed inside, outside, above, below, right, left, and so on. Data could be time varying, uh, time series data. So in, again, in addition to the different kinds of tasks we talked about before, um, an additional task could be to find events um, that occur before or after a particular time step or events that occur uh, periodically after a, a regular amount of time steps. Extending the dimension uh, to, a, to D which is greater than 3, we often call this as multidimensional data uh, where the domain is an n-dimensional space. Um, some of the tasks that we talked about for low dimensions uh, are very much applicable to multidimensional data. However, um, displaying this is, uh, um, is tricky um, because often we are restricted by the medium uh, in which we want to display the data. So this is typically 2D, maybe 3D. So uh, the kinds of tasks that um, are applicable in uh, the case of multidimensional data um, is different. So for example, often we ask uh, questions such as find some patterns, find clusters of uh, uh, data items, uh, find correlations among uh, uh, data items uh, such that these patterns can be highlighted in the data, find outliers or gaps and so on. So these are um, uh, more reasonable and more uh, appropriate tasks for multidimensional data. 
Another type of data is tree data, which focuses uh, on the relationships or hierarchies uh, between the items as opposed to individual items. So in the case of uh, a tree, the, the relationships with one's parent and ancestor is, uh, is important. So the kind of queries are also uh, appropriate here. So uh, qu queries such as how many levels are there in the tree, um, uh, given a particular item, how many children does it have, how many siblings does it have, uh, what are certain structural properties of the tree, um, fan out, and so on. Um, extending this uh, further, we have a data that is a graph or a, or a network. So here the focus is on individual items and the links between these items. The tasks are similar to the tree. However, uh, there is no clear notion of a hierarchy. So the tasks are, uh, for example, what is the shortest path between two items? Um, what are connected components? Um, of items and so on. The set of tasks can be also uh, classified uh, as follows. Um, so we have uh, different kinds of tasks so the, uh, that we talked about while uh, discussing the different types of data. Um, so there are seven tasks uh, uh, that can be uh, considered. One is an overview task. Uh, the overview tasks um, ask, uh, the, the overview task talks about um, providing summary statistics. Um, and then there is a zoom task which uh, um, where we, we may ask questions about individual data items. A filter task um, corresponds to um, I identifying a collection of items and either removing them or highlighting them. Um, details on demand task is one where uh, we may want to set the where we may want additional details about the items that are filtered. A relate task um, asks for relationships um, between um, data items. History task asks for um, the evolution of the data item over time and extract task asks for identifying interesting patterns or subsets of the data. Let us now talk about the domain and the different types of domains. Uh, um, again, following the uh, the broad outline of this uh, the, this lecture, which is on data classification. So the domain is made up of different cells. Um, so you can think of the cells as building blocks. Um, so we want to talk about the different building blocks that are available. The building blocks could be linear in different dimensions. So the zero dimensional version is the vertex, 1D version is the line segment, 2D is a triangle as we have seen in the computer graphics um, uh, pipeline. Uh, quads are also potential uh, 2D cells. Uh, in 3D we have tetrahedra or voxels which are cubes. Um, we could also have um, prisms and pyramids or wedges in 3D, which could uh, be the building blocks for constructing our domain. So cell types need not be restricted to linear elements. One could often, one could also have nonlinear elements. This allows for a more accurate interpolation of values between the vertices that define the element. Um, further, the, the domain could be represented with fewer elements if one allows for curved geometry. Um, so typical, uh, uh, more popular, among the more popular nonlinear cell types are the quadratic and, and cubic. Uh, 
such as the the B splines in uh, in the case of cubic. Um, uh, so these are used, for example, in uh, the modeling of surfaces um, um, in of vehicles, for example. The individual cells can be uh, put together into a, into a representation of the domain. Um, now there are different ways again of putting, uh, collecting the individual cell types. So let's talk about that. A square grid is probably the most simple way to represent a domain. Uh, a square grid is a decomposition of the domain into cells. Um, that lie, uh, whose points lie on a regular square lattice. So the individual cells are simple squares or um, cubes in 3D. Um, so in this case, the points and the cells are uh, just arranged uh, such that the points lie on um, uh, lattice points um, uh, which are equally spaced. Um, so essentially the geometry um, is regular, the step size or the spacing between the points along the different axes are equal. Uh, this leads to regular geometry. The topology or the connectivity between the individual cells is also regular. So this leads to regular topology as well. A rectilinear grid is a minor variant of the square grid where um, the grid points um, um, and the cells are again on a regular lattice. However, the step size is variable. So uh, this means that the topology continues to be regular. However, the geometry is only partially regular. So one needs to explicitly store the spacing between the points. So what you see um, um, in the slide, um, here is a reg rectilinear grid. As you can see, the step sizes are different. They keep increasing um, in this case, uh, but this need not increase monoto monotonically. It could change uh, depending on the, the need and the spacing in the X the step size in the x direction uh, is independent of the step size in the y direction. Both the square grid and the rectilinear grid are special cases of a more general structured grid which has regular topology as before. So the connectivity of a cell to its neighboring cells is regular and need not be stored explicitly. However, the geometry is irregular. So for example, what you see uh, here is a structured grid where the cells, each cell is connected to, uh, each cell is connected to four cells, adjacent cells, similar to the structured, uh, similar to the square grid or the rectilinear grid. However, the geometry is warped. So, um, um, however, the geometry is actually warped. Um, but what is important is to note that the while the geometry may be warped, the individual cells do not overlap or intersect each other. So, while the topology can be stored implicitly and does not need to be explicitly written down, the geometry needs to be explicitly specified by um, right by um, storing the set of uh, coordinates of the individual points the cells in these in this particular case are all quads um, and in 3d could be hexahedra so such a representation a structured grid representation is very useful for finite difference methods uh, that are used for solving a system of partial differential equations. Scattered data is essentially a bunch of uh, points 
um, irregularly placed in space. So the geometry here is completely unstructured uh, and needs to be fully specified. There is no topology whatsoever. So the connectivity between the points uh, is not stored. There are, uh, in addition, there are no cells that are uh, explicitly defined. So in order to visualize such data, one may have to convert it into a structured data, um, uh, either a square grid or um, a general structured grid. A common way to represent a domain is using an unstructured grid. This is the most generic form of uh, the grid. Uh, uh, let's see why this is so. So in, a, in an unstructured grid, the geometry and the topology is completely unstructured. So which means that both need to be explicitly specified. Um, of course, this requires much memory, even for simple domains. Uh, on, the, on the plus side, this allows for an efficient representation of even complex domains with few number of elements. More importantly, it is adaptive in the sense that it can represent um, domains whose geometry um, is irregular and changes um, uh, across the different subsets, different regions of the domain. Um, uh, so the unstructured grid is good at representing such domains with a few number of elements. We will see this more uh, in detail in, a in the coming slides. So what does it take to represent a structured mesh? So here are some examples of structured mesh. Um, as is clear, we need to store the data values. So this could be stored, for example, as a linear list. The topology is simple to store because it is implicitly defined. So all one needs to need to store is the dimensions and the step size um, along each axis. Like I said, the topology is stored implicitly. So um, as long as one can store the um, the the step size or the the procedure that allows us to compute the next point along each axis then we are done so this uh, is the space critical step how do we store an unstructured mesh so this is the same domain represented now using an unstructured mesh, which is, which is a collection of triangles or a collection of polygons. So for example, the polygon in blue here um, has eight nodes, V1 through V8, and has 12 edges. It has five interior polygons um, and an unbounded uh, polygon exterior. So how does one represent such a unstructured mesh? Um, the geometry, of course, can be represented by storing the location of each vertex. Essentially, the x, y, z coordinate specifies the location of each vertex. Now, how do you store the topology or the connectivity? There are many ways to store this. A simple way is to just store the collection of polygons as um, ordered list of vertices. Uh, the adjacency between uh, the, the poly individual polygons can be inferred by the shared edges. So for example, in this particular case, there are six interior or shared edges. So for example, E10 is a shared edge. And if we represent the entire mesh as a collection of polygons, then uh, the polygon here 
has a shared edge E10 with the adjacent polygon that I show as a dashed arrow. There are other ways to represent uh, the polygonal mesh. Um, each representation um, carries with it its own advantages and disadvantages, either in terms of the memory required or the efficiency of with which it can support uh, queries. How do we represent scattered data? So as I mentioned, the scattered data is essentially a collection of points that are irregularly distributed without any explicit connectivity information available. So in order to specify connectivity, one has to find a so-called good triangulation of the domain using the data points. So the scattered data points, uh, the input points happen to be the vertices of this triangulation, which is a triangle mesh in 2D or a tetrahedral mesh in 3D. So here is an example in 2D. Of, of course, there are many possible triangulations. One has to choose one triangulation. Um, in practice, um, we often choose good triangulations such as what is called the Delaunay triangulation. If you are more interested in such triangulations, you can uh, uh, take the class next year um, on computational geometry some aspects of this will also be covered in a course on computational topology so once the data points is converted into a bunch of triangles which is a triangulation then what we have is a unstructured mesh and uh, uh, the tasks that are supported by an unstructured mesh are also applicable for the scattered data. So a recurring theme when we talked about representing these different kinds of uh, domains was good data structures um, for storing the domain. A good data structure separates the geometry from connectivity. By connectivity, I mean the topology, how the cells are connected to each other. The geometry is often stored very simply by reporting the locations of the vertices. The connectivity essentially needs to um, inform us about the organization of the individual geometric primitives. Note that the connectivity or the uh, adjacency between the individual cells holds even if the geometry changes. So you can imagine that two triangles adjacent to each other, the vertices could move thereby deforming the domain but the triangles may still be adjacent to each other. So in this case we would like to make minimal change to our data structure and update only the geometry or the location of the vertices. So our data structure should support such changes to the uh, domain. The data structure should support efficient queries which is uh, typically adjacency queries given a cell who are the um, adjacent cells. So for example given uh, uh, given a vertex who are the edges and faces that are incident on this vertex or given a, a, a given a face uh, who are the vertices that are incident on this face or who are the faces that are um, adjacent to this face. 
there are many such adjacency queries. Uh, we want our data structure to be able to answer these queries efficiently. Uh, adjacency queries could also uh, appear in other ways. So for example, um, given a pair, a vertex and a face, uh, we would like to answer the query, is the vertex X incident on the face F? Given a pair of faces F and G, are they adjacent to each other? Uh, you can imagine several situations where such queries um, arise. One is uh, something we have seen already, that is normal computation. If you would like to compute the normal at a particular vertex, then you need to be able to query and find out all the triangles that are incident on this particular vertex. Let's move on to the next uh, aspect of data classification, which is based on the attributes. This is going to be a shorter description. The data attribute could be scalar, which where you have essentially a single value at each location in the data set. So for example, corresponding to every vertex in the domain, we have a single value. So scalar data examples could be temperature, pressure, or uh, precipitation, uh, or some kind of density at every um, sample point. Another kind of data attribute is vector valued, where you have a magnitude and a direction. So examples could be velocity or force. Data attributes could also be tensors in general, uh, tensors of different ranks. A rank 0 and a rank 1 tensor are again scalars and vectors. However, you could also have rank 2 tensors like mat matrices and rank 3 tensors and so on. Rank 2 tensors are uh, more common in scientific data. Um, higher rank tensors are uh, less frequent and we don't, uh, we don't come across them as frequently. Visualization tasks can be classified um, uh, based on the dimension of the domain and the type of data attribute. So we have seen the data classification based on the domain and the attribute. Uh, we'll conclude by talking about the different types of visualization tasks. So here is a chart that summarizes what we want to talk about. Uh, and here's the legend. Um, so on the x-axis, you have the dimension of the domain, and on the y-axis, you have the di dimension of the, the data attribute. Um, uh, tasks A, B, and C um, are very simple and something that we have seen uh, maybe even in our school days. Uh, task A is where you have the domain of uh, dimension 1, and you just want to know uh, for example, the location of some particular item, so the gas station's location on a on a road and so on. Um, uh, uh, task uh, C is uh, is something where you want to know the distribution of some data attribute over a one D domain. Um, so A, B, and C are simple tasks, and uh, the the visualization is also uh, simple and something that we may have seen already. Um, tasks D, E, F, and H are uh, what we will focus on in this particular class. Um, so this is where the domain is uh, two or three dimensions and uh, your attribute is also two or three dimensions of one dimension which is scalar and uh, the visualization is non-trivial often especially when you go to 3D domains. Uh, and um, uh, you, one may need different uh, uh, or multiple ways to visualize the data in order to be able to understand um, and report the different patterns. So, um, so examples here are D where your uh, uh, 
where your domain is 2D and you have a scalar value defined over it. So for example, you could think about the uh, elevation uh, over a particular uh, terrain. Uh, e is a um, uh, 2D domain um, and you may want to study the wind velocity over this domain. Um, you may want to look at this over a 3D domain as well, which is H. Um, uh, F is, uh, F, what is the example? F is, uh, for example, a, a vector field uh, or airflow inside a 3D domain. So 3D domain and a 3D 